Mr. President, the Senate is currently debating the authorization or reauthorization of Section 702 of the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act. I've called this the most important law that most Americans have never heard of. But it is essential, an essential tool for our intelligence community to protect the American people against a whole array of threats, as I'll try to explain. But it is somewhat complicated, which means that it's important to make sure that we understand what the facts are and dispel any myths or any misconceptions about what exactly we are asking the Senate to vote on. Unless the Senate takes action soon, Section 702 of the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act will expire at midnight tonight. If that happens, the United States will lose access to valuable intelligence that's needed by our intelligence community to keep America safe. Our country's top intelligence figures, officials have shared a number of success stories that demonstrate the far-reaching value of this authority. But the best I can tell, there is broad bipartisan consensus about the value of Section 702. I've heard no one stand up and say, we should just let the authority lapse. And that's, a good, and that's for a good reason, that you haven't heard that argument. Section 702 acquired information has helped combat terrorism, disrupt drug trafficking, thwart cyber attacks, and prevent our adversaries from trafficking in weapons of mass destruction, and much more. Officials have also issued warnings that, in the starkest possible terms, that about what a 702 lapse would do to our security missions. FBI Director Chris Wray said allowing 702 to expire would be, quote, an act of unilateral disarmament in the face of the Chinese Communist Party, close quote. So the stakes are extremely high. And I'm glad that the Republican-led House passed a strong 702 reform bill last week. This is not a clean reauthorization of the existing bill. This is a reform bill which corrects many of the problems that we've experienced with Section 02 and application, including some abuse by FBI officials and others. It's designed to prevent that inadvertent abuse and to hold people who abuse that authority accountable. And to those who say, well, this reform bill has provisions in it that can be likewise abused by somebody who's intent on violating the law, I say there's no law that can prevent people from lying, cheating, and stealing. In other words, we can do our best to try to pass a law that protects the American people, both in their privacy and their national security, but no one argues that we can prevent all abuses. But we can go a long way, and this bill does it, to close up the opportunities to do that and to hold people accountable who do abuse the law by exposing them potentially to long prison sentences. Well, this reform legislation increases transparency, as I said, prevents misuse of 702 and strengthens accountability within the FBI. As Congress has debated this law, I've seen a lot of confusion and occasionally even some misinformation about this authority and the reforms being discussed. As the Senate prepares to vote on this bill, I think it's absolutely critical that we clear up a few of the most common misconceptions about Section 702. The first myth I want to address is that 702 is unconstitutional because it allows widespread surveillance of American citizens without going to court and getting a warrant establishing probable cause. I've heard some people say, under this law, the intelligence community can spy on the American people. Nothing is further from the truth. 
Section 702 authority cannot be used to target any U.S. citizen, whether on American soil or elsewhere in the world. It is specifically aimed at foreign actors overseas that could pose a threat to the United States. We all acknowledge that any investigation into any American citizen would require a warrant establishing probable cause issued by a judge, an impartial judge. That's our basic protections under the Fourth Amendment. This, in contrast, is not about targeting Americans in the United States, but rather foreigners overseas. Even if the foreigner is in the United States, then Section 702 would not allow that collection. There would need to be a warrant. So the law contains robust safeguards to protect the privacy of U.S. persons, and the House passed bill includes even more provisions designed to strengthen those protections. This first myth stems from perhaps a misunderstanding about what's called incidental collection of U.S. persons' data. When I use the term U.S. persons, I'm including American citizens and legal permanent residents. That's why the generic term U.S. persons rather than U.S. citizens is used. For example, if an American is texting with a foreign terrorist who's a target of 702 collection, both sides of that conversation, that text, would be available. To be clear, though, the government would only see the American's communication in that one instance. Other texts emails and communications would remain untouched and require a warrant issued by the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court. Multiple courts have examined the constitutionality of this incidental collection. The Second Circuit, the Ninth Circuit, the Tenth Circuit have all looked at it and said it does not violate the Fourth Amendment. The Eastern District of New York has as well, as has the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court. I might just pause there for a moment and remind people that the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court is a court created by Congress composed of three federal judges, Article III judges appointed by the Chief Justice that review these practices and procedures on a regular basis. So you have three levels of oversight of these important tools. You have at the agency level, you have internal rules and regulations, you have the Senate and the House Intelligence Committees, on, on which I have the privilege of serving, that conducts oversight. And then you have the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court that makes sure that this balance between security and privacy are protected. In every court that's looked at this issue, the court has determined that 702 complies with the Fourth Amendment, the Fourth Amendment insofar as incidental collection is concerned. Section 702 does not authorize spying on the American people. You know, it reminds me of the saying of Mark Twain. Mark Twain said, a lie can travel around the world in the time it takes the truth to put on its shoes. And unfortunately, some of these things get on social media and people begin to believe them because they see it repeated, even though it's not true. This is a carefully crafted law designed to balance national security imperatives with individual privacy rights. Myth number two, Congress could strengthen privacy protections and preserve 702 by adding a warrant requirement. Now this requires a little bit of an explanation. I mentioned that the text between a target, a foreign target, and an American citizen and the incidental collection, that is, the, the communication between those two that would be revealed by 702. Then it's added to a database that can then be queried or explored by subsequent actions by intelligence agencies, including the FBI. Some would say, well, in spite of the fact that no court has held that that incidental collection is unconstitutional or violates the Fourth Amendment, before the FBI or any part of the intelligence community wants to look at that lawfully collected data, it's got to go to court and get a warrant. 
Again, this would require the government to show probable cause that some crime, maybe espionage, maybe some other crime has been committed. All of the officials that serve in positions of responsibility in making sure that this capacity continues safely and respecting the rights of privacy as well as the security of our country has said that adding a warrant requirement to look at information that you've already lawfully collected would decimate the effectiveness of Section 702. This is unlike the tr a traditional criminal investigation where warrants are issued based on probable cause because of criminal activity. Intelligence gathering is unique because it involves monitoring foreign actors to detect and prevent threats before they occur. In other words, regular law enforcement doesn't go in and try to stop criminal acts before they occur. Unfortunately, we're relegated to investigating and prosecuting crimes after they occur. That's the criminal law context. Intelligence gathering is very different because it's designed to prevent terrible actions from occurring in the first place, like the 3,000 Americans that were killed on 9-11 when Al-Qaeda targeted the World Trade Center and the Pentagon. Well, as Director Ray has said, a technology environment where foreign threat actors can move to new communication accounts and infrastructure in a matter of hours, if not minutes, Section 702 provides the agility we need to stay ahead. Requiring a warrant for every inquiry into lawfully collected information in the 702 database would significantly hinder the ability to respond to emerging threats. And again, this is looking at information that every court that's looked at it has said is lawfully collected under the Fourth Amendment. Our intelligence community would be held to an impossible standard knowing the nationality and location of every single person that the foreigner in a foreign land may be talking to before they can make any targeting decision. The Senate has before it an amendment that would hold that no person, so that would include the entire intelligence community, may, may access information of a covered person except in limited circumstances. A covered person is broadly defined and would include incidental communications of UN's U.S. persons, something which is already lawfully collected. But the truth is this amendment would hamper the 702 program in dangerous ways. If an amendment containing this language passes, the CIA or the NSA will be unable to monitor a Hamas or ISIS terrorists abroad unless and until they can determine the national identities and physical locations of everyone that terrorist may be talking to, texting, or emailing with. It's an impossible burden. The Senate's also expected to vote on an amendment to the House bill that injects a different type of massive legal hurdle in the 702 process that would be similarly confining and limiting in terms of its effectiveness. This amendment would dramatically expand the role of an amicus. Now, in the law we talk about amicus curiae, friends of the court. That's what an amicus is. That's an outside person coming in basically to provide legal advice or briefing to a court to help the court make a decision. And there already exists an amicus provision in the current law so that if the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court needs additional input or expertise or advice on a complex matter, it can ask for that. That already exists. What this amendment would do would impose an amicus appointment in virtually every Foreign Intelligence Act Title I matter and place, again, unworkable burdens on the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court and on the intelligence community seeking access to that information. What that means in practical terms is that 
we would get bogged down in court proceedings, and not just in front of the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court. This amendment would allow an appeal of the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court's decision to presumably all the way to the Supreme Court. Can you imagine in a time-sensitive national security matter that we're going to basically take a time out so we can appeal the case up and down, up and down the uh, federal judiciary, potentially to the Supreme Court with who knows how long the delay might be? The urgent intelligent request before the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court would become a means to gut Section 70 through, through a series of legal delays. In effect, one actor who disagreed with the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court's determination would have the ability to stop what is already a co constitutional and lawful program in its tracks. This is a radical departure from the role of an amicus or friend of the court in normal court proceedings. The friend of the court, the amicus curiae, is there to provide expertise and help the court get it right, not to gum up the process or to become an adversary. As I noted, agility is a key to Section 702. It gives our intelligence professionals timely and actual intelligence to keep Americans safe expanding the role of the amicus to turn them into an adversary uh, to this process would hamper the program and I believe make it far less useful. The House has already had a very thoughtful debate about this topic and I believe crafted a bill that expands amicus participation in a reasonable and productive way without shutting down the process. Finally, myth number three. There will be no impact to section o, if Section 02 expires tonight at midnight because other directives will replace it. Well, like many misconceptions, this is based on a grain of truth. Earlier this month, the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court renewed the annual 702 certification and procedure process through April of 2025. Interestingly, as I mentioned, the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court, which includes three Article III judges, lifetime tenured judges, regularly sign off on the practices and procedures under Section 702 and have found them to be lawful and constitutional. And they have certified the current process through April of 2025. But that does not mean that the program can continue uninterrupted for another year. In the event of a lapse tonight at midnight, some communications and service providers will stop cooperating with the United States government. That's exactly what happened in 2008 when the predecessor to Section 702 called the Protect America Act briefly lapsed. The Attorney General and the Director of National Intelligence at the time wrote to Congress about the impact of a short-term lapse. They said, quote, Providers delayed or refused compliance with our requests to initiate new surveillance of terrorists and other foreign intelligence surveillance targets under existing directives issued pursuant to the Protect America Act. But they said ultimately, they said the lapse, quote, led directly to a degraded intelligence capability, close quote. None of these American base companies are going to cooperate with the intelligence community unless they have a law in place that provides them a requirement that they do so and the legal protections that go along with that. Even though the Department of Justice could go to court and move to compel the companies to continue to cooperate under the current certification, litigation would in inevitably lead to delays while vital intelligence is lost. And I believe that without 702, there is no way these companies will be required to or be willing to cooperate. And there couldn't be a more dangerous time to put this gambit to the test. Director Ray and the Director of National Intelligence, CIA Director Burns, all of the members of the intelligence community, the leaders have said the number of threats facing America has never been greater, certainly not since World War II. Iran and its terrorist proxies are attacking Israel. 
Russia's continuing to its assault on Ukraine, and China is fueling instability in the Middle East. Section 702 underpins our ability to predict and respond to each of these threats, and we would be flying blind without 702. So 702 misinformation runs rampant, but here are the facts. 702 complies with the Fourth Amendment. Every court that's considered the matter has reached that conclusion. Section 702 is invaluable because it gives the United States timely and actionable intelligence. Warrant requirements or a dramatic amicus expansion would undercut that capability. And finally, unless Section 702 authority is extended today, our intelligence capabilities will take a hit. There's no question about it. We cannot count on these communication providers to keep providing information and cooperating once congressional authorization expires. So Mr. President, in conclusion, I would say there's a lot on the line today, and Congress cannot in good conscience deprive America's dedicated intelligence professionals to, of the authority they need to continue to keep our country safe. Section 702 of the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act is vital to our national security and must be extended as reformed in the House bill. Mr. President, I yield the floor.